Exposition by Charles Hedden Spurgeon 2 Corinthians 1, 1 1-20 Verse 1 Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Paul is very careful to remind the Corinthians of that fact, since some of them had gone the length of denying his apostleship altogether. 1. And Timothy our brother whom, in all humility, he associates with himself, although he was a younger man, of far less consequence. But Paul loved him very much and, therefore, he put his name at the beginning of this epistle side by side with his own, and Timothy our brother. 1, 2. Under the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia, grace be to you and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Christianity is a religion of benedictions. Whereas worldly people often use the language of courtesy towards one another without meaning what they say, the saints of God put a fullness of meaning into their expressions and really wish every good thing to those to whom they write. Grace be to you. That comes first, and then peace follows. Peace without grace is a very dangerous possession. But a peace that grows out of the possession of grace is a gracious peace and will lead to the peace of heaven before long. This grace and peace are to come from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no grace for us apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And though the Father is full of love and will give grace and peace to his people, yet the Lord Jesus Christ must always be the channel through which these incomparable favors must flow to them. 3, 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Nothing less, then, shall be given to the tried people of God than that same comfort which was enjoyed by the Apostle Paul. It shall be shared by all who are resting where Paul rested. 5. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds by Christ. The apostles were the most tried, but they were the most comforted. They had to stand the brunt of the battle, but the Lord was their strength in a very special sense. Observe the balance in this verse, as the sufferings, so our consolation. And as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds by Christ. With little trial, we may expect little comfort. It is better to leave the whole matter entirely with God, or else we might almost desire to be dug about by the spade of affliction, that we might receive more of the living waters of consolation. 6. And whether we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. That is the grand objective of Christians, to live for others. When God has helped us to receive both our comforts and our sorrows as matters of trust that we are to take care of for the benefit of our fellow Christians, then have we learned the lesson which Christ would teach us by them. 7. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so shall you also be of the consolation. How these things are put together. God does not call his people to the one without the other, no consolation without affliction and, blessed be his name, no affliction without consolation. 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, 
insomuch that we despaired even of life. Why would Paul have them know this but that they might understand that he had to suffer as they did, and even more? Sometimes God's people are apt to think that their ministers are not cast down as they are. They look upon them as a sort of superior order of beings who have no doubts and fears, no lack of strength, no despair. But that is an idle fiction and the sooner it is gone from our minds, the better. For those who lead the people of God will rather have more afflictions than less. Seeing that they need more instruction than others need, and that instruction usually comes with the rod, in all probability they will have more of the rod than others will. Paul, therefore, is anxious that the Corinthians should know in what seas of trouble he had to swim. 9. 10. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves but in God which raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. It is supposed by some that the apostle was in danger of being put to death in same extraordinary way, perhaps by wild beasts in the amphitheater. We know that he speaks of having fought with beasts at Ephesus. We cannot tell whether there is any illusion, here, to that trial, or what it was. But it was evidently some death which, to the apostle, seemed to be exceedingly terrible. And when he was delivered from it, it was to him like a resurrection. He speaks of it as having been worked by God that raises the dead. And he puts down this deliverance, together with some other of which he was at that very time the subject and does deliver, and upon these experiences he builds his expectation that God will yet deliver. 2. You also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons thanks may be given by many on our behalf when many pray, after the blessings is received, many will give thanks. Paul rejoices to have been the object of interest to a large number of Christians everywhere in the time of his great peril. And when he escaped, he believed he would still be the object of their interest and that there would be more prayer in the world, and more praise, too, because of the dangers from which God had delivered him. It is worthwhile for any of us to be in sore sickness, or in great straits, if, thereby, the quantity of prayer and praise in the world shall be increased to God's glory. 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world, and more abundantly to you. For to them he had been specially particular that in no point they should speak of him as having used the wisdom of words. Among them he determined not to know anything except Jesus Christ and him crucified. To them he was like the nurse who administers milk to babes. 13. 14. For we write none other things unto you, than what you read or acknowledge and I trust you shall acknowledge even to the end, as also you have acknowledged us in part some of them disputed his apostleship, but most of them did not. 14. That we are your rejoicing, even as you, also, are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. What a happy condition of things it is when the teacher and the taught mutually rejoice in each other when the teacher is the joy of the flock and when he can rejoice in his people. This is profitable to all, but when there are discards, and fault finding and the like, this is neither glorifying to God nor profitable to the people. 15-17 And in this confidence I was minded to come unto you before, that you might have a second benefit and to pass by you into Macedonia, 
and to come again out of Macedonia unto you, and of you to be brought on my way toward Judea. When I therefore was thus minded, did I use likeness? Or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no? There were some in the church at Corinth who said, He promised to come and see us, but he did not keep his word. They declared that his promise could not be depended upon and that he very easily changed his mind. Now the apostle had done nothing of the kind. He had solid reasons for his change of purpose and reasons full of love to them, but they misrepresented him. Do not, my dear friends, count the fiery trial of misrepresentation to be any strange thing. Even some of those whom you have loved and for whom you have been willing to lay down your lives will turn against you. It is no new thing that they should do so. They may take anything which you have done in the simplicity of your heart and turn it against you. Whenever they do so, I say again, do not think that any strange thing has happened to you, it happened to Paul, then why should not you have a similar experience? 18-20 But as God is true, our word toward you was not yes and number. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Paul loved to turn from some lower subject to his Lord. When he wrote the words, yes and no, they suggested to him the perfect constancy of the love of Christ and thankfulness for his faithful promises. So, as the thought came into his mind, he could do no other than put it into the epistle he was writing, for he never missed an opportunity of praising the Lord Jesus Christ. I wish we could all imitate him, in this respect, far more than we have ever done, for, our Saviour is worthy of all the praise we can ever give him, and more, too.